Welcome to another episode of the Choose Strong Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. A special hello to our uh, YouTube viewers. Um, I'm super excited about our guest today. We have, and I'm finally announcing this week, um, as people have been asking, I've been talking about my coach, uh, who has been coaching me for the last five weeks now. And I'm super excited to reveal Jason Coop who in my opinion, the best ultra running coach in the business, um, but is also my friend. Uh, we also have here Billy Yang, who not, as I was announcing, as I was announcing Jason, <laughs> was I can coach you too, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can handle that smoke. Uh, now, if you listen to our episode last week, we had Billy and Hillary Yang on, and I just couldn't, you know, resist bringing Billy back. Oh, on. I'm going back to back. Yeah, oh, you're oh, going. God. You're going back yeah. to back. I believe it is back to back. Okay. Um, I don't know. Eddie's marathon might be in the middle of that. We haven't recorded yet, so yes, this is very well going to be a back to back. And um, who doesn't Ooh, I love be a part of that one? Too. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't love hearing Billy's voice through that microphone? Um, what I do know to be true is that we have three friends around this table. We've all known each other for quite some time, but um, really, my hope in bringing Jason Coop all the way out from Colorado Springs um, was to introduce them introduce him to you, my audience, and um, allow you to get to know him. Now, if you follow his podcast, um, and also, as you know, I've recommended his book many times on this podcast, then you know that Jason is a wealth of knowledge. Um, he cares very much about the sport. He cares about the truth in the sport, the science in the sport, um, and he's a very hard worker himself. So I'm really excited to have him come on today and talk a little bit about what he does, but I've already surprised him by saying, we're also just going to talk about him and his life and not just science. So um, maybe that'll be a little bit uh, different than what he's used to, but I think overall, this is going to be a wonderful conversation. Now, Billy has something on the edge of his... <laughs> <laughs> on the tip of my mouth. I oh, know Billy so scared. well. I mean, <laughs> I was going to say, he's a hell of a prankster too. He is a prankster, we so I'm hoping that he is... Uh, uh, not going to insert any jokes into um, some real serious questions that I'm going to ask him. <laughs> oh yeah, let's get serious. Let's get serious. I'm rolling my. This is going to totally be a serious conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to get scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have like schemed in the background before. I do like a pre-production meeting that I didn't know about. <laughs> well, I think most of our listeners know um, our podcast. We like to keep it real. We like to keep it raw. And we like to invite you to sit at the table with us. So um, if you have just started your run, as always, I like to say, I put my coach's cap on and say, well done. Well done for making it happen today. Well done for getting out there, for showing up for yourself. If you are lifting, if you're on the bike, um, know that by the time you are done finishing this episode, that you're going to be a little bit fitter, a little bit stronger. And we are always so proud of you. To our youth listeners, what is up, kids? Thanks for being here. Remember that you are strong. You get to choose that every single day. And to those that are driving to or from work, you've just started dinner in your kitchen. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to be in your ears. We know that we're going to have a good time. Now, and shout out to all my bathroom listeners, too. <laughs> Because that's why I, that's my other office where I like to spend a lot of time listening to podcasts. You're a serial toilet tech. Oh, aren't you? come on. Like, come on. You know you Those, are. The, it's like the people who deny taking their iPhones to the bathroom. It's like, come on. We all do it. That includes podcasts. But are you one of the people, like, in the airport that carries their conversation into the urinal and you're um, still talking to no. your lovely wife, Hillary? You know why? Because like, I got embarrassed one time when I walked into the bathroom. Someone was having a conversation. Thought they were talking to me. I responded, and yeah, <laughs> <laughs> never lived that down. It's already going off the rail. Yeah, already <laughs> this conversation's quite interesting. Now, Jason, let's just go ahead and just dive into all things. Let's break Jason. down the zones. Of yeah, an <laughs> Please start there. No, we're we're gonna keep me in my wheelhouse. Yes. <laughs> we're gonna take Jason down a different trail, Jason. Oh, dear. It's that <laughs> <laughs> Jason is usually used to talking about facts, science. I mean, I, I'm telling you, you listen to his podcast, you're going to learn a lot. But who is Jason behind the coach? Where did you start as far as, let's go ahead and go all the way back 
to school. I mean, mm-hmm. we were talking about your time at Baylor. You went to Baylor for a couple years. But I would love to hear about how you personally got in to running. And um, I guess school school age is when that started. But what was your journey into running? Because for as long as I've known you, there is one thing that sticks out to me a lot that I maybe not everyone gets to see. And that is you are 150% invested in your athletes. You genuinely care. And you have a big soft heart. And I feel like the athletes that you coach, every single person that I've ever talked to who is is coached by you has a lot of wonderful things to say about you. Um, I know Lucy Bartholomew, who's, who's one of your coaches, uh, one of your, your athletes, when she found out that you were coaching me, um, she sent me a picture of you hugging her at the finish line at UTMB. And she literally said, he's like a second dad to me. And he's so wonderful. And Aww. I haven't since chatted with some other athletes who have said the same thing. You are there for them. You are real. Um, you are invested in what your athletes do. And you genuinely love the sport. You are a participator in the sport. Um, and you care about what is happening in the sport. So I'd love to know just where did that love develop? When did it start for you? Um, well, thank you for that intro. It's uh, uh, very personal and touching. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I started out as a team sports player. I grew up in Texas. You know, football was king there. Yes. Started football when I was you know, a young kid and then migrated over to basketball sheerly because I hit my growth spurt <laughs> earlier than everybody else. So I've been six foot one since I was in sixth grade. <laughs> And uh, uh, it made a very easy transition uh, onto the court. And a lot of that uh, kind of facilitated my love of, of, of all sports. But I learned really, really early on that I was very good at the conditioning drills. So we do conditioning drills in basketball or in football. And I was always, you know, one of the top people there. And I just liked it. I just liked competing in that kind of head-to-head fashion where you knew who the winner was. The winner was the person who crossed the finish line first. So you're quick. You notice you had speed at a young age. Yeah, and I, mm-hmm. I think more like more importantly from like a personality uh, perspective, I just like that head-to-head nature, mm-hmm. you know, it's where it was just you against the other person or you against the stopwatch or whatever. And then when uh, I stopped having the advantage of height <laughs> through this growth spurt, I kind of migrated into the endurance sport. So I did triathlon for a long period of time. I did cycling for a long period of time. I ran uh, cross country and track all through high school and then in uh, college as well, the division one program. What and, were your uh, events? Uh, and... I ran the 1500. I, I, I was not that, I was a very mediocre runner on a mediocre team. So my coach had put me in any any event where I had the potential to score one point, which at the time was eighth place. You get eighth pl- <laughs> place that attract me, you get one point. So he'd always use me as almost like a utility player in baseball where if there was an opening in the thousand meters indoors or something like that, or an opening on a distance medley relay, he'd kind of put me in there. So I really had no specialty because I wasn't really good at any of those things, but I'd always go in and try to, and try to compete. And, um, uh, that background is really how I got into coaching. Um, I needed a summer job when I was 16 years old to try to I don't. I can't remember what I was saving up for. Maybe it was certainly wasn't a car. It wasn't that. It was. It wasn't that big of a purchase. A science kit. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Pokemon cards. And I need. Yeah, Pokemon cards. Dungeons actually, and Dragons. I, I still actually. True story. I still have all my old baseball cards from when I was when I was a kid. Oh, mm. I bet some of those are worth a pretty penny. Yeah, especially. Too. See. Yeah. Well, you grew up my, in the 50s, 60s? Yeah, and 50s, yeah. <laughs> like Will Chamberlain. Wagner. Yeah, wow. Uh, rookie. Actually, I do have a, I have a Michael Jordan rookie card. Nice. I have a bunch of- 1984. Uh, Tro- Tro- Troy Eggman yeah. rookie card. Oh, wow. 1988. Wow. So I met Troy Eggman, by the way, in yeah. person. Yeah. 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 I watched him win a couple Super Bowls. Yeah. Okay. All right. You got me there. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so anyway, um, so I, I, took a, I took a job as a youth track and field coach with the track club that I, uh, that I, that I ran with for a long period of time. And I kind of instantly fell in love with just watching kids and teenagers at that time progress, you know, in in that situation, you can put a kid out on a, uh, the long jump runway. And from the beginning of the session to the end of the session, they've all of a sudden learned how to hit the board correctly from not being able to do that. They can actually get into the pit from not mm-hmm. being able to get into the pit. 
and that that type of like seeing that progress just was it was kind of it was really revealing to me that it was something that I like to do and I kind of pursued it in like little bits and pieces where I'd go back in the summer I'd coach and I'd go to USA track and field coaching certification and then I'd you know help out with our college team when I could and things like that but it all just kind of originated from you know, team sports and realizing what I was good at and what I was not good at and using that as the kind of like the, the catalyst to figure out a career path. Mm-hmm. Now, now, when you say that you went to college to run, and, but you don't think you, you call yourself mediocre, what's the percentage of athletes that actually get to go to college to run? Well, very few. So I <laughs> kind of get what you're getting at. I would yeah. say, I, you know, I kind of put it that way for the people who like understand college athletics and understand mm-hmm. track and field. You know, mm-hmm. I might have had a, I think that my fastest 1500 meters was like 350 or something like right. that. Right. And so I suffice it to say that 0.000% of, or maybe 0.01% of listeners probably could run that. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So Very def- small percentage definite, of people def- can run a 1500 de- that. De- definitely relative. <laughs> but I mean, here's the thing, Sally. Like, I also, like, I have a very good scope of what high level athletics actually looks like, right. you know, not just in running, but in a lot of other sports. And when, when you, when you see that and you see it in a very, uh, uh, in a very visceral way, in a very tangible way, it gives you perspective on who is really good mm-hmm. and who are just, you know, hacks like Billy and I are just, you know, pure hacks. <laughs> but um, yeah, because what were you like 358, Billy? Yeah, it's <laughs> somewhere in that area. <laughs> Give or take a minute or two. <clears throat> so you had speed, you loved the sport, and at 16, you started coaching. So is, is that like at 16 years old until now, have you never not been coaching? No, ever since then. So I'm wow. 40, 45 years old. I'll be 46. So wow. you guys can do the quick math on that. That's nearly 30 years that I've done it in some, in some capacity. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I like I said, I'm just really grateful for it. My youth track and field uh, coach Tom Clark, who I owe a tremendous amount of uh, light life debt to, he you know put me in charge of these you know kids at the same. I was their peer. You know, it wasn't it's not like I was older. Or, you know, I had some sort of special qualification or whatever. I just kind of like like doing it. And uh, I, for, he saw that in me through whatever mechanism that he could actually use. But it certainly was a – now that I can, like, look back on it with nearly three decades of hindsight, it was a pretty big catalyst for me because it completely suited my personality set. It's obviously what I wanted to do with life. And I, I haven't done anything since. Like, I haven't had another job. I haven't wanted – I have never wanted to have another job. I've never wanted to have another career path since then. And I think that that's really uh, – It's just really – it's very rare <laughs> and it's very fortunate that I've been able to do it because there is something about doing one thing for that long of a period of time that's unique in this world where we have a lot of people that jump from career to career and industry to industry and place to place. We were talking about moving, you know, so many places uh, uh, before we started recording. Mm. And not to say that that's bad, but there's just something about doing the same thing over and over and over and over again that makes you appreciate the journey that you uh, have experienced along the way for how good you can get at that one thing. Mm. And so you've seen, not only have you seen the sport of running change over the decades, I mean, it was incredible being a coach for 30 years. Um, what what would you say has been the hardest part about being a coach? Um, so I, I was kind of like brought up in coaching from a physiological background. Mm-hmm. And some of that just has to do with the education that I had. And some of that had to do with the kind of the mentors and uh, the people who were responsible for kind of training me and, and teaching me how to be a coach, they had very much a physiological uh, bias. So it was really learning the psycho-emotional part of it was, I, I don't know if hard is the w- right way to put it, but it was kind of the most difficult for me to grasp because I didn't have that orientation. But as your earlier story kind of alluded to with Lucy and the other, and the, and the other athletes, it, it's the one that I've taken the most amount of time and effort to actually professionally develop so I can have so I can have empathy so I can you know kind of see what's going on behind you know behind a person's eyes and say the right thing at the right time and connect with them with the right 
language and the right motivation or honesty or whatever you know emotion that I have to I have to pull out. But that that has not been easy for me because I'm not I'm not cut from that cloth so to speak. Mm-hmm. It's had to be it's had it's been something that I've very deliberately developed over the uh, over the over the course of my coaching career. And ironically enough, as much as people want to like focus on the science and what I do with my podcast and things like that. That trait is the one that I rely on the most Mm -hmm. in my day-to-day career, for sure. Mm -hmm. And go ahead, Billy. Well, I just, I wanted to, um, I think the audience, even though you told the story a couple of times, would love to hear about your evolution or maybe a step back into ultra running. Like what, what about the sport? I understand you were passionate about it. You're an active participant. But when did you realize, oh, there's clearly a dearth of coaching in this space. How could I potentially fill that, even though it's not it's not exactly an exact science when it comes to all these variables that come in with uh, running 50, 100 miles? Yeah, I mean, mo- most people will readily identify me as an ultramarathon coach, and certainly that's what I do for, for a living right now. But the fact of the matter is, is when I first started coaching, I, I primarily worked with cyclists and then some triathletes and then very few runners. And that's just because that's where the market was. You know, there was no such thing as a remote-based running coach or even ultra marathon coach uh, for that uh, for that matter. And so, although I was personally involved in running marathons and trail runs and ultra marathons and things like that, um, from a professional standpoint, I was working with a completely different uh, gr- group of athletes, and it had nothing to do with anything aside from that's just where the mar- that's how I could earn a living. Right? I would much rather have wanted to earn a living within the trail and ultra space just because I identified with it more, but it very, very clearly wasn't there. And then sometime around like the late two thousands, that tide started to turn a little bit. We started to see it more, started to see this coaching as a thing, get more adopted into the trail and ultra running space. And gradually I was able to kind of like chip away at that. And when you first were trying to infiltrate the space, was what, what are we talking like early aughts, mid aughts? Yeah. Late 90s. Yeah. And I, I mean, uh, you know, so I, I worked for a company in, who I still work for today at CTS. And we deliberately tried to go into the trail and ultra running space. And I, you know, went around the country and I tried to convince a lot of high level athletes that like coaching was a thing. And it was a resounding no <laughs> amongst that group or amongst that group of athletes. And I gave up on it for a long, for a long period of time. I'm like, I tried it. I tried, we tried to capture this audience. We were trying to capture it from certainly from a business perspective, but also I had a personal interest in the sport. It was a deliberate strategy, right? To try to expand the portfolio of, of, of sports. So that, what that were we some of their with. responses? Like, they were just like, <laughs> I'm just going to run 200 mile this weeks and call it good. Yeah, yeah. This is dumb. Like you don't need you know, sophisticated training for it. I'm just going to run a lot. Like the so whole kind of like, whole I mean, it kind of work like back then, right? Yeah, Especially if you're targeting the church. Well, as the new Antons runners coming into it, that's what we gathered from it. That everyone was just, just trying to figure it out. Yeah. I, I would look at some of the stuff that people are doing or weird plans you'd find online. And it was like, run six miles, four days a week. And then on the weekends, run 20 and 30 <laughs> on Saturday, Sunday. That was like what I knew everyone to do. It was like, you just... It's all about the back-to-back long run, and that is it. Nothing else. No workouts. No hill repeats. No. Nothing. Well, so the the the, <laughs> the the lens of information that I was coming from was the ultra list serve, right? Which you guys have been around for long enough. You remember that? Which OGs is, remember? Yeah. yeah. The OGs remember. I don't know how to describe it, but basically it was like a, a cross between an email thread where everybody's carbon <laughs> copied on and like an old AOL forum, yeah, like some yeah. weird mashup of those two things. <laughs> And I would read it, and with all due respect to the people that were contributing to it, <laughs> the advice given on it was just so horrifying. Mm-hmm. And once again, as a professional coach, <laughs> that I looked at that and I said, okay, I can make a difference here because I can you know, change this advice from here to here, and it actually would make an impact on people. But the moral of the story is, is that the audience wasn't really that receptive to it at the time. For, for whatever reason, maybe it was me, maybe they just didn't like me, they didn't like my delivery or whatever it was. And, and I don't... I can't really pinpoint exactly why that sentiment changed over the course of the next four or five years, but it did. And now you see it kind of all overall in the space where not only uh, are a lot of people coached, but there are a lot of coaches. And I, I can you know tell this. I, I, I uh, designed this uh, education and certification content for a company called Uesca, 
where it's kind of intended for people who want to become coaches and they've got a triathlon arm and a cycling arm and a running arm and, a, and an ultra running arm. We've had a thousand people go through that course, a thousand people that have gone through that course to become ultra marathon coaches. Wow. So to, and this is not in that long of a period of time. This is in 12 or 15 years. So from go to one end of the spectrum to the other, it's actually been really like, it's been cool to see, but it's also been personally gratifying because of those polar opposites to where at one point you had people like literally laughing at you Yeah. to yeah. now you have like a, pro- a well-received product that's deliberately intended to get pe- more more coaches into the marketplace. I mean, you see it across the board, right? Yeah. With nutrition, how that's leveled up, gear, yeah. uh, media, you know, back yeah. in the, b- b- all the way back in 2013, 2014, <laughs> you know, just like me and a couple of other photographers, videographers, but now it's just like- Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. a whole cavalcade cool. of people yeah, following cool. all these athletes. It's cool. So cycling, did you cycle yourself? Oh yeah, I did it all. I did road races, criteriums, time trials, mountain bike races. I, in fact, it's so fun, uh, fun nugget of wisdom here. I did the Leadville Trail 100 mountain bike race. Oh my! Before I did the Leadville Trail 100 run. That is gnarly. I remember running down the power line, that steep oh, descent. Yeah. Yeah. And my first thought, because a guy that was running with me had done the, what is it, the ultra? The lead man. Suit, the yeah, lead yeah, man. Yeah, the yeah. lead man, yeah. And I asked him all, were you terrified on your bike? I'm like, this is gnarly running down this, but I cannot imagine the terror of running, oh, yeah. biking down the side of this mountain. I mean, that's incredible. That was. Yeah. I mean, once once again, like I, it, I, I realized I wanted to be a coach. I, I didn't know what the sport path was to that, right? I didn't know what endurance sport I'd ultimately be involved in, so I could just take what I whatever I was getting. And what I, what we were getting at the time was cycling. The the onboard power meters being pervasive in like the commercial space, so not just amongst the elite athletes, really catalyzed a lot of that movement. They were them and the triathletes were kind of the first adopters to bring on coaches in a remote setting to uh, uh, to work with. And so we would just take what we would get, you know, and at the time it was cyclists. And so I, I went from being a collegiate runner to being a, a once again, a very mediocre, you know, very mediocre cy- cyclist where I could compete in any type of race. And, you know, I could learn, I could learn the sport from the inside out, essentially. And, and you were drawn into that because of the coaching that side, not so much because you loved cycling. It was like definitely the coaching side first, right? Wow. I, I needed, I knew I needed something to kind of like satiate that for me personally. Yeah. Um, and uh, I liked all endurance sports, but uh, for 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 sure, the cyclists and the triathletes were the kind of the first adopters of this, you know, kind of like new way of working with athletes that I just mm-hmm. very much liked, and I happened to be one of the. Uh, kind of one of the early movers into that uh, into that space. Me and kind of our mutual colleagues that, that I've worked with over the years. But yeah, it was not. Hey, I want to be a run coach. I want to go figure this out. It's hey, I want to be an endurance coach. I'll figure out the sports side of it, depending upon what you know, kind of what lands in front of me. This episode is brought to you by Gooder. Gooder makes twenty five dollar active sunglasses that don't slip, don't bounce, and are one hundred percent polarized. If you want to support the show and pick up a pair. Gooder is giving Choose Strong podcast listeners free shipping on your first order. You can go to gooder.com backslash Sally and use code Sally to get free shipping. Gooder offers a 30-day money-back guarantee and 100% satisfaction. Find your pair at gooder.com backslash Sally and use code S-A-L-L-Y to get free shipping. So you did triathlon too? Did you do Iron, Iron Man? I as never well? did an Iron Man. I always Not did yet. Olympic distance and half Iron Man distance. Yeah. That, that I mean, so much respect for that because you have to swim for okay. one. Billy, are you a good swimmer? I'm, I swim like a bona fide rock. Like yeah, I, no, <laughs> bona fide they're... rock. Not just a rock. A bona fide <laughs> bona rock. Is that like a better than <laughs> like, better than a normal rock like or a worse? Legit... <laughs> you know, what's not a, a toy rock. Like actually a rock. <laughs> so. Uh, 
<laughs> Another passion of Coops right now. Uh, speaking of all these different disciplines, is, yeah, is like he's like MMA. multi multi sport oh, yeah. athlete. He oh, yeah. is <laughs> super passionate about MMA. I know you you get in the what? weeds of that. Do you? Oh yeah, he's a big. Why did MMA I not guy. know I'm this? For how fan. long? When yeah, did this start? Fan. Do the research, Sally. Jiu Jitsu. I poured over. <laughs> you all poured over. The you asked ChatGPT. ChatGPT. But do you draw? Do you draw some parallels with ultra running and MMA? Because you probably know. I mean. It wasn't. It also wasn't that long ago when yeah. MMA was kind of the Wild West, and oh yeah, you know, they were calling them barbarians, and it was like crazy. How are you like allowing yeah. this and sanction? Like, it is kind of crazy to seeing the growth of MMA and kind of in parallel with ultra running, right? Well, wait, wait, hold on a minute. Yeah, how long have you been doing MMA? I had, well, I not doing MMA. I don't do MMA. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just a fan. I'm a fan. <laughs> Oh, Bad. you're not out there like getting in the cage no, and fighting. No, okay, no, this I is what I'm thinking. No, 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 no. For a no, moment, no, no. I was like, <laughs> very you much really a are a man of many talents. <laughs> no, very much a fan. <laughs> very much a fan. But if you look at if you look at that sport, right, the growth of that sport mirrors the professionalism that that sport has gone through. So in the early days, you're right. Yep. It was dudes beating each the the, fir, the very first MMA match was actually in Denver, right? So we're very close to where I live. And it really was just dudes beating each other up in a cage. There are no rules or very few rules. Yeah. There's no sanctioning governing body. There's no anti-doping control. There's no like framework for kind of anything. They just lock the doors and It was like whoever. the tank abbots of the yeah, world, exactly. just like yeah, big ex grizzled guys. Exactly. But now it's on ESPN. Yeah. And if you go to ESPN.com right now, the biggest sports distribution platform in the world, it's one of the top three things that you can you know see when you initially go to that page. That trajectory from being this obscure thing that has been banned, yeah. right? And uh, it was banned in New York State as of, what, five or six years ago, right? To where it is right now completely mirrors the professionalism that the people who have been in charge of that sport have, have, have brought to the table. There are a lot of parallels uh, with that and in other sports. You can look up mountain biking. It's kind of the same thing. Trail and ultra running has been the exact same thing. The growth and the popularity of the sport. Yeah, rock definitely, climbing. Yeah, rock climbing the mm -hmm. same way. And, and I think that there is, once again, from from a when I look at this from a professional coach's point of view, there are a lot of parallels that you can draw in terms of how to grow a sport and how to make it more ex more accessible and more appealing to people who don't participate in the sport. Like I don't participate in MMA that you can look at and say, hey, listen, this sport followed this trajectory. If we want to do this in another sport, we can take a lot of like learning lessons from that. That's why I think it's so important that what we're living through right now, the the latest, I guess, growth potential is in the live broadcast, right? Like, yeah. mm -hmm. will people tune yeah. in who's not of the sport and how do we make it more accessible so that they, they can follow the players and know the players and and kind of fall fall in love with the yep. the characters of the sport. Yep. That's a great parallel because the entertainment product that the UFC puts on is a fantastic entertainment product even if you're not really that into the sport. It's fun to watch, the color t commentary is great, the pageantry, mm -hmm. you know, is we really We need a heel. That's what we need because I found well, he wasn't a heel back then, but the my entry point was Conor McGregor. Yeah. And maybe oh, it was yeah. somebody yeah. like him, funny. maybe it was somebody like uh, Ronda Rousey, somebody who can transcend the sport. I think Courtney kind of has that Ronda yeah. Rousey type factor, yeah, although yeah, yeah. I would argue she's infinitely better, you know, more dominant in our sport, even though Ronda had her Ronda had a run. But yeah, somebody like that who can transcend the sport. That that's definitely a catalyst, you know, and every sport has every sport has had that, right? So you go back to the triathlon days, days Dave Scott, Scott Tinley, oh, like yeah. those people, they they helped Dave transcend Scott. that sport. Certainly Mark Lance Allen. before his yeah. fall in cycling. Mm -hmm did that for cycling, particularly in, in North America. But even if you look at basketball, right, Michael Jordan era, mm. LeBron James era, like they, you, it, anytime you have one of those superstars that is meaningful to people outside of the really hardcore fans, it helps elevate everything. So I, I, I agree with you, I agree with you, Billy. It's just a matter of time before there's one or a few of those in a, silly little sport like trail and ultra running which kind of it, it it'll it'll be like a rocket booster on hey, whatever you could put silly little over. insert blank of any of these sports that we talked about right at one point in time yeah, yeah. at one point in time you're absolutely right yeah. absolutely well i want to continue on your journey so here we are now you're cycling 
Um, <laughs> I haven't touched my bike in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> One point I did a lot. One point I did a lot. You're cycling. So you're coaching um, cyclists and then you start doing triathlon for the same reason. Are you yep. like, okay, I'm now going to start doing triathlon. So, so is your desire then at this time, I want to understand athletes. I want to understand their sport. I want to understand, understand what they're going through. What, what, what motivates you to do those things? Cause those are hard. <laughs> Triathlon is not easy. I mean, you have to be disciplined in three things, three sports essentially. And that's a lot of time and dedication is your, and, and is your coaching at this time? Is that supporting you? I yeah. mean, are you able to compete and coach and were you married at this time too? <laughs> no, I was not married. <laughs> so, 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 fu so funny story. So I first started coaching. Um, and, um, I, the whole industry was new at the time. Like it was very brand spanking new. We didn't have the tools. We barely had the internet capacity to, to, uh, have a conversation or transfer files or look at data or anything like that. The technology, uh, was not, it, it was just in its, it, its very early stage. And, uh, I, I remember this very distinctly. The, so the first full-time job that I had as a coach I signed on the dotted line and I'm, I was making $22,500 a year annually wow. with my big fancy degree and everything like that. And I had to take a part-time job at Bennigan's. It just, oh is that my. restaurant still around? Bennigan's, in Bennigan's? let's go. Yeah. So I'd, I had always had odd <laughs> jobs at restaurants, whether it's Bennigan's or Fridays with my seven yeah. pieces of flair or whatever it is. <laughs> Were you um, a waiter? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah I waited <laughs> yes. and I tended bar. For, I'm for, just thinking for, about office space right now. Yeah, me yeah, too. Yeah. That was that was me. I don't know where I was quite going with this. Oh, but um, I, I've always uh, I've always uh, been a big believer that if you really want to kind of like master some, something, you have to learn one, do one, teach one. Hmm. And so, although I wasn't a cyclist by trade, I was a runner by trade. If I wanted to coach cyclists, I had to I had to be a cyclist. Now, I don't think that that's universally true. Uh, hmm. I know a lot of coaches, a lot of very good coaches, that are not really all that involved in the sport that they're ac that they're actually hmm. doing. But for me, part of my part, I know that part of the way that I learn is kinesthetically. And so I have mm -hmm. to actually get it, get into a Peloton and rub elbows with people and have my handlebars get hooked around somebody else's handlebars and, you know, see a crash happen in front of me in order to empathize with the same things that are happening with the group of athletes that, um, um, that I'm working with. And so, and I still try to do that today where if I have an athlete that is working, that I'm working with, where even, even though the sport isn't novel to me, maybe the event is actually novel. I'll get out on the course and put boots on the ground. I'll fly around the world just to run, you know, a third of the course or fourth of the course or something like that, just to give me a little bit more of the lay of the land of what the athletes are actually, uh, what the athletes are actually going through. So that's always been one of my MOs is I have to, personally, I have to experience whatever I'm coaching somebody for just to give me, it gives you a little bit of street cred, if I'm being honest with you. Like people will be like, "Oh man, Coop's, I think that's Coop's, yeah. Coop, Coop's done the Tour de Jot, right? Yeah, like yeah. We get we yeah. get that commercially, or, what, or whatever else the whatever else the race is." But the real reason I do it is because I feel that it makes me it makes me more effective because I have a a, a, a ground a ground level view of whatever the athlete was actually going through. Well. Yeah, and as you know, so much of the of the sport, especially the longer the distance gets, I mean, both of you guys know, is between the years. Yeah, yep. And so, like, how much of that is you know you managing the psychology of the sport versus like the physio physiology? Well, at a, at a certain point, we have to be as coaches. We have to be realists, and we can only move the physiological needle so much. Especially, right. I mean, Sally's a great example of this, right? She's been training for how many years? Have you been seriously training for? Over twenty. Yeah, over twenty and, years. And in, so, in two different sports. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so my my point with that is is you've run that physiological. Um, that physiological improvement to 96 or 98 percent of what you can actually get maximally. Sure, we can keep you up there, and we can always kind of tweak, you know, kind of things around the edges. But as an athlete's career develops, or as an athlete just gets more experienced, even if they're just a normal person, the more everything else matters as a, as proportion to their fitness. Mm -hmm. 
So as much as I am a physiologically oriented coach, I completely understand that we have all of these different components that go into performance. It's always a multifactorial outcome that's not solely dependent upon one variable or two variables or anything like that. It's dependent upon a whole host of variables, all of which have different weights, but those weights change as an athlete develops. And certainly the, the, the general flow of the way that those things change is the physiological capacity kind of, you can't really move it all that much. So these other things have the opportunity to move it at that point in time, just as much as not more so than the physiology. So that's true with psychology. That's true with nutrition. That's true with gear. That's true with tactics, how you actually approach the race from a pacing perspective. Yep. All of these things that, that, uh, get overshadowed by fitness early in their career they then become a bigger part of the pie because the fitness needle has kind of gone into the red zone or is at its maximum. Yeah, mm -hmm. like the great Anne Tracen said, a lot of ultra running is problem solving. Exactly. And that could be nutrition. Yeah, but she can say that because she was great, right? <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, she was like, okay. When, yes. when, yeah. when Anne Tracen was early stage Anne Tracen, the proposition is much different. It's how much fitter can you get? Fitness yeah. dominates the entire, not the entire, but it dominates the vast majority of, of the landscape. Mm -hmm. Once you become great, then you have all of these other things that make the difference between you improving or not improving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you think that a you can have a good and effective coach without actually doing the sport, putting yourself in those situations getting a run of the land. I mean, do you think that you can be a good coach yeah. without doing that? I, I just happen to have one one of those coaches as one of my mentors. His name's Dean Golich, who uh, coached Allison Dunlap to the first mountain bike world championship ever. So the first time they held the mountain bike world championships, this was, uh, right, it was right after 9-11, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, she won that race in Bell, Colorado, and he had a prolific uh, endurance coaching career, many world champions, many Olympic medalists, Olympic champions and things like that. He was not a cyclist or a mountain biker by trade, like no, no way, but he knew how to coach people for the sport. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that that is possible. I do think it's rare though. I don't mm -hmm. think that you find that in, uh, in, in a lot, in a lot of coaches. The opposite is also true. And we actually have more of this problem in coaching where people rely too much on their athletic experience and then project that yeah. athletic experience on. Hey, on, I'm onto fast, their, uh, like, <laughs> let me coach you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, and I, so, what, so once again, like I always temper that, I always temper that strategy where I have intentionally tried to do a lot of the things that I'm coaching my athletes for. I try to temper that with, I also don't let that bias me to the extent that I'm projecting whatever my learning lesson is from that onto my athletes. It's still an individual process with each athlete and they're gonna go through things that are that only they're going through, that only they're experiencing uh, uh, out on the course or in a training session. So is your mentor a great communicator? Well, I've had a lot of, so Dean, <laughs> Dean has, uh, I hope Dean actually listens to this. <laughs> Dean has a very particular way of communicating. And Sally, you will appreciate this. And I definitely take this from his particular counsel. He's very blunt. Mm -hmm. So he's very upfront. This workout, you did great. This workout, you didn't do so good. Here's how we can improve. It's very, mm -hmm. uh, it's very factual, mm -hmm. yet kind of uh, empathetic at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but... I, I have had the great fortune, if I could just back up a little bit, as opposed to answer that specific question, mm -hmm. of having really good mentors that I did not deserve at the time from the highest level of sport. And those mentors represented all of the things that I needed as a professional coach. Mm -hmm. They represented the testing and the science and the physiology side. They represented the practitioner side as a coach. They represented the nutrition side. They represented the psychology side. And I just happened to have access, and I say that very deliberately, just happened to. It's not like I created it. Mm -hmm. I just happened to have access to all of those uh, people when I was really young and I didn't know what I was doing and I couldn't coach myself out of a wet paper bag when I thought that I had all of the knowledge and the skill set and things like that behind me, I had all the certifications and I had all of the degrees and all this kind of stuff. Having access to those people really meant the world to me and I soaked it up like, like a sponge. And that's where I decided that if I'm gonna continue to get better, 
I have to learn one, do one, teach one consistently. Mm -hmm. So I'm always doing something. I'm all I'm always learning about something, primarily through my podcast and you know, doing research and working with, you know, fantastic collaborators. And then I'm also teaching other coaches on the backside. So it all comes in this huge full circle and that that has been something that's that's been very deliberate and I would not have a, have had that experience without having some of those like early uh, early professional mentors. So you're you're fully immersed at all times in yeah. whether that is coaching, teaching, learning. I I would I would say that among all industries, within all industries, some of the most effective leaders are incredibly effective communicators. The ability to communicate with any type of personality is not something that's easy to do. So you talk about your friend who's very blunt, he's straightforward. That's effective for maybe a, a certain type of athlete, right? Yeah, Olympic level athletes. Yeah, Olympic level. <laughs> shoot me straight. It was either good or is it wasn't. What do I need to do to improve? Okay, red here we go. Red or green. Yeah, red or green. And I think that, you know, with, with the rise of so many coaches, and you, you did bring up that point, like, oh, I ran a 50-mile race. I should be able to coach somebody now. But coaching isn't just your experience in the sport. It isn't that you cracked open a book and that you, you learned what A, B, and C meant. It is being able to communicate within all sides of the sport. And I think having empathy and understanding and knowledge, I mean, the, those go hand in hand. Would you say that communicating takes up the majority of your coaching time or is it writing training plans? It's definitely, well, I think writing training <laughs> programs is part of communication. I don't view those as, as completely uh, distinguishable uh, I aspects. guess I'm thinking of like you and your Actually, office by yourself. Mm, yeah, yeah. When, that like, takes very, very little like, time. Like mm -hmm. I, I, can, I can program you know, I can, I can program almost in my sleep. Not that I do that. Yeah. I, tend, I, always, oh, I believe it. I always it's... want to be an active process. Mm -hmm. But for at least for me, thinking about how I'm going to articulate something to an athlete, I always put the most amount of time and emphasis on. And I don't know whether I view that as more or less important, but it's always been, I've always known that when I've made mistakes coaching, it's never been in the programming or very rarely been in the programming side and very rarely on the analysis side of things. I'm very adept at those skills. I can look at workouts and say, yeah, this is red or green, right? Just like we we're talking about earlier. But whenever I've made coaching mistakes, it's because I didn't, I, I didn't explain something correctly. Or I didn't take the time to articulate it in the way that I should have articulated it. I rushed, I rushed through it or I didn't think that the point of communication was, uh, was all that important. And, and I've, I'm very much somebody who I learned from my mistakes. So that my dad taught me when I was really, really young. He always used mm -hmm. to tell me, you can make you can make mistakes, just don't make the same one twice. Mm -hmm. And so for, for me, at least, I always find that it may be not more time, but certainly more effort into thinking about how I'm going to articulate something to an athlete, whether that articulation is in a training program or whether it's the council after a training program or I'm going to articulate something in real time, like at an aid station in a race where you have 60 seconds to say something. I'm always putting the most effort into into that part of the coaching process. And it, like I said, I think it's a combination of the fact that I've realized when when I've whenever I've screwed it up, I've screwed it up in that area. But also it's just something that um, I feel that can have like the most impact because I can put down it's like when we are having our conversation, Sally, mm -hmm. I can put down, hey, I want you to do this workout. I want mm -hmm. you to run up the hill five times, right? Mm -hmm. But if I tell you why I want you to run up the hill five times and then afterwards say, hey, listen, this is the effect of that running up the hill five times, you then now believe that that this was the right thing for me. So mm -hmm. you're going to do it harder. You're going to do it more effectively. You're going to do it more mm -hmm. accurately. And you have the belief that it's all going to work. And trust me, if you believe something is going to work, it typically is going to work. There's all yeah. kinds of fantastic research around ar yeah. around that component. And um, uh, I realize that that's part of the process. If I can get an athlete's buy-in by correctly articulating what's going on and how it's going to make an effect, it only enhances the things that I do that I think I do very well from the onset, which is doing the programming and analyzing the programming. Mm -hmm. It's like the Simon, Simon Sinek uh, theory of like starting with the why and then talking about yeah. the how and the what, not, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Don't go into the what or the how and then the why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yep. I guess one of the things I'm I 
And this is why one of the reasons why I want to have this conversation. Yes, you are known for being brilliant, a brilliant coach, knowing the science, doing your homework. Um, and I, I do believe the way that you communicate with your athletes, the way that they feel seen, the way that you're invested, that's not something that a lot of people, I don't think, know about you. Um, that isn't something that you're going to talk a lot about on your podcast. But, And I know in the beginning, you also said, I'm just not cut from that cloth. That's something yeah. I have to work really hard on. I think that's something that all people can work on in every area of their life is the ability to have empathy, compassion, understanding, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. This isn't just come down to sport. And I think it's very telling that even though you say that you don't have to do the thing in order to be a great coach, that's really important to you personally. It's important to you that you feel what your athletes feel. It's important to you that that you experience what they're going to experience. And that's likely why you are one of, if not the best coach in ultra running is because you understand what it feels like at mile 88 when your stomach's going sideways and you have this goal and things aren't going right. You actually do know what to say to an athlete. And I, I would suffice it to say that, yes, I, Billy, you brought this up. The further we go in race, the further we go in endurance, what is going on between our two years is the most powerful thing because we see it historically in sport all the time. I have no idea how that athlete pulled that off. I have no idea how Michael Jordan, when he had the flu, yeah. how he came out to win the championship. I mean, it's like the, you know, remember Carrie Strug when she stuck that landing in the Olympics on like a broken ankle? How did she do that? You couldn't tell anyone in any sport matter what sport you're doing to go out and perform well and win a gold medal on a broken limb and and from bystanders we look at it like she needs to stay safe she needs to stay comfortable but like a coach her coach bella caroli knew what to say to her he knew how to coach her he knew what she was capable of and and you already said it belief and i think that's kind of what i'm zeroing in on is the the way that you communicate belief to your athletes ha also has a lot to do with the way that they trust you and you putting yourself in positions that they're in allows that layer of trust that maybe someone who has never been in that position is saying, well, just do this. And it's easy for an athlete to say like, well, you've never been in that situation before. You've been in a lot of very tough, you've done like all the toughest races in the world. And I think that you're able to speak a lot from your experience, but I think what I'm trying to highlight is that it, it seems to be very naturally important to you yeah, because I realize you feel what your athletes are you calling are him the Ted Lasso. Of I ultra am. I'm Believe telling you, Jesus. everyone thinks that he's <laughs> that he's just this science hard hitting guy, and I'm saying there's this layer of soft Jason Coop that is just that is entirely compassionate and very understanding, and that is, I think, that plays a massive role into why so many of your athletes are highly successful. I mean, I know when I came to you, I was like. I'm bottom of your barrel roster. <laughs> I'm not going to be the, I am not Sally. your star at all. Like, because I know who you coach. I mean, men and women who you coach, they are highly successful. And I, I really do believe the com communication, compassion and understanding is a, and the belief, there has to be that belief there. It's, it's monumental. You can have all the book logic and science in the world, but if you're missing that part, it's, I, I think it's a, a big gap. Here, here's the catalyst for that, though, because that's definitely been something that's deliberate. So I, I went, I, I, I was talking earlier that I was kind of brought up in coaching from a physiological bias, right? We'd look at training files and we'd, oh, here's your power output and here's your heart rate here and your recovery mm -hmm. between intervals is this and lactate that and blah, 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 blah. I could do that until I was blue in the face. Mm -hmm. And I still had a cohort of athletes, which was not trivial. It wasn't like one or two percent or whatever. That um, just they just didn't have the buy-in. You know, maybe I was young. Maybe I couldn't explain the story correctly. Maybe I wasn't. You know, maybe I wasn't communicating effectively or whatever. But what what I started to find out very early on is that if I could just go to an event and be there, just be there, not not do much, 
just be there. Just imagine a cycling race. You're just there. Like mm-hmm. you're not crewing somebody like we think about an ultra marathon. You're just there. That created the buy-in process a thousandfold better than I could over the phone, over a Zoom call, or any other form of uh, of communication. Uh, just being there. And so I made a very conscious effort, probably about a decade ago to just get out in the field more, just to go to races and be there. I didn't have a plan. I didn't like say, okay, I'm gonna you know do this and I'm gonna do that and this is gonna be the outcome of it. I didn't have an ROI or anything like that. I just went out to races and what I very quickly found out, it was that it was so incredibly effective, not just in what I mentioned earlier, getting like boots on the ground and things like that, but just being there at that either moment of triumph or disappointment or wherever in between the outcome actually was for that particular for that particular race was really impactful for the relationship. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, from, from that is kind of where why you see me around all the races where mm-hmm. I'm at because I realize that it's it – Every makes, race it, I've been to, you have been there. Yeah, Not as my coach. I mean, this yeah. is like for all the years I've been in the sport – you were at every race. Oh, you again, man. Jason is everywhere. But 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 it became deliberate because I realized it made me more effective. Right. So I like being out in the community. I'm gonna lie. I like yeah. going there. I like getting the sweaty hugs at the finish line mm-hmm. and all that stuff. But it makes me a more effective coach. I'll, I'll tell you a really great, uh, a really really great story about that uh, about this that that happened last year. Uh, so about f- sixteen months ago. Uh, I took on this this really good Chinese athlete. His name's Jai Xing Shen. He's had a really prolific career inside of China. And we got connected through kind of a serendipitous, you know, three, four, five degrees of separation type mm-hmm. of deal. So last year he was going to race Trans Grand Canaria. Um, and the way that our relationship works is that he does not speak English. His wife is a translator for him. So I can't go to a race and crew him. Because we, mm. we we can't communicate. Sure, you can like mm. point to things. I can put them in Th- that whole thing that you do when you're supporting athletes via verbal communication. We just we just kind of can't do. So I flew all the way out to Trans Grand Canaria to see Shin race at this one race last year. He was my only athlete there. It's big. It's a big lift, yeah. right? That comes out of my pocket. It's time out of my day. Got to you know put other athletes that I need to communicate with kind of on the back burner or whatever. He ends up dropping out of that race which is a big thing for a Chinese athlete. They have a lot of pride in finishing what they start and and things like that. But I was able to build a more robust person-to-person relationship with him and through his wife being a translator through that experience than I ever would over a thousand conversations that we have over WeChat or whatever virtual Mm -hmm. uh, kind of virtual means. And now we have this unspoken like this unspoken communication, this unspoken relationship where I can just be there at a race and he knows what I'm thinking and I know what what he's thinking, even though we do not, we literally do not speak any of the same language. Like no, I speak no Chinese and he speaks no English. But it was all, that all was facilitated by me flying over the Atlantic to go to some, to go to some very specific race and just see him compete at that and watch him drop out and watch the disappointment kind of wash over his face, Mm -hmm. let all of that emotion kind of get out, and then sitting down with he and his wife and his then then two-year-old son Mm -hmm. and kind of working through how we were going to work together uh, going forward. And so I, I just use that to illustrate that just being there, even when you can't communicate, like this is the best example. We, can, we literally can't verbally communicate. Just being there engenders a different level of trust that you can that you can foster with an athlete that goes far beyond a file analysis or physiological testing or or, or, or anything like that. That's why I'm here right now, right? So I don't, I could care less. No offense to this podcast. <laughs> I could care less about doing this podcast, but I want to come see your home, hang out with you for a little bit in order to foster that coach athlete relationship that is new to us right now. That is another level of just the Sally Jason relationship that we had, you know, six weeks ago or something like that. So I guess my point with that is, is just being there is just an incredibly important part of the whole deal. Pausing here for a quick message from Inside Tracker. 
The path to better health isn't rocket science. It's health science. For something as valuable as your health, there's no reason to leave anything to chance. So whether you want to improve your heart health, cognition, metabolism, sleep, stress levels, or overall health span, Inside Tracker reveals the exact areas of your health that need improvement through comprehensive blood testing, DNA analysis, sleep and fitness tracker data, and your current daily habits. Inside Tracker's scientists have shifted through the research so that you don't have to. So stop playing guessing games. When it comes to your health and longevity, you can save 20% on all of Inside Tracker tests with the code SALLY at checkout. Um, I, I definitely want to get into the dynamics of your relationship. I know oh it's it's only been a couple of months, but... <laughs> I've always been curious. This is, this is gonna Here we go. <laughs> no, but I've always been curious about, you were talking about communication. You were talking about what happened to Shen. What, how do you treat an instance like that when you've had weeks and months of build up to this one event and it doesn't go well, they don't finish? What is, how do you communicate with their athlete in those moments of, and how do you personally see something like that where and at were, that level yeah you were highly well, competitive mean, it could be highly competitive but it could also be just one of your mid to back of the pack athletes and they had this big goal of finishing a race and they weren't able to come out of the other end at the finish line like to you in some way try to try to like disassociate from it being a failure on your end on their end and how do you communicate and think about that um, you know, I don't, I don't profess to have a universal blueprint across that because it's highly individualized for each person, but I always make sure to respect the emotional component first before getting into the tactical piece. And I would do that on the positive side too. So somebody has a gigantic win and I've had both of those, right? I've had people who have performed really poorly and people who have performed quite, a, quite amazing at the, at the highest level. The, the only university, the only kind of like universal element of all of that is to respect, and I'm using that word very deliberately, to respect that emotional component and give it space before then you go in and start to do whatever you're going to do next, whether it's a course correction or, you know, you want to take advantage of, you know, having a hot hand or whatever it is. I, I do think that the emotion comes before tactics, right? You have to kind of clear that piece of it in order to to really be able to, to, to think clearly. So you're talking about yourself too, to like, Oh, for sure. You from 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Because, you know, when I have athletes do really well or, or win races, like I want to go freaking conquer the mountain too. Like it's a mutual, it's, it's a, it's a mutual thing, but I have to let that wash away from both me and the athlete before we can then like sit down it and, and process it o outside of that, just to not to dodge the question too much, uh, uh, Billy, I, I really do. I really do um, try to take an individualized approach to it. So, what did the race result actually mean to that athlete in terms of how much they put into it? And they might put their family aside for a period of time in order to train for it. And was it really? Could it have been really big for their career? And you know, this example of Shin, he realizes that I'm you know flying just for him to like meet him. That's a big part of it, and make sure that's like that that that's not lost in the. Um, that's not lost in the entire storyline. Um, but I try to figure out what the thing means to that individual person and then pull on those threads to do whatever the next, to do whatever the next step is. So if I take, take the positive or I take the negative example and I turn it into a positive one, if it's somebody, if it's an athlete, that's then won the biggest kind of thing in their life, the next step is, is okay, let's figure out how we can keep you on top of the mountain. Like what are the next steps for that? So, so anyway, I guess my point with all that is, is the emotion has to kind of get washed away before the logic and the, and the, the tactical parts of it uh, can come into play. Yeah. It's like going back into your corners when you're arguing with your spouse and just be like, down's out the top to argue. Time out. <laughs> time out. <laughs> so, let's, let's revisit this conversation. <laughs> I'm going to go for a walk. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go see, for a walk. But you do see it on both sides. You see people like try to try to like the classic thing is, is they want to do a makeup race. Yeah. Right. They get sick right before, you know, their key race or whatever. They get injured or they miss the start for whatever. Like something happens. They have like, a bad race. Fitness, whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Fitness. Right. And they're like, boom, ultra sign up. Like the next day, I'm going to plunk down my credit card for 300 bucks and do something like two weeks later. You're making an emotional choice as opposed to a rational one. 
and you can use you can use like the fire in your belly or that emotion to to be a part of the to to be a part of the dialogue but you have to do it in concert with everything else you can't let it overwhelm the dialogue to the extent to where you're always making the majority of your decisions based off of that really heightened emotional state so can I finally ask about you two? <laughs> <laughs> is this why you this is really why you brought Billy in to play? No, no, I'm really curious. <laughs> about that you here. Other than yes. you being a brilliant mind in the space, yeah. you know the race. Mm-hmm. You uh, you run Western states. I I imagine at least a couple times, once. right? Once, once exactly. Okay. Once, exactly. and it poses a unique set of challenges. And Sally, last time you crossed the finish line, speaking of emotion, you were devastated. You were. And in a time and a place that most pe- other people would freak out about, oh, you finished yeah. in the 11th place, one spot away from out of the podium. So, um, you know, here we are 10 years later, or oh, nearly eight. 10 years later. Eight well, years later. 10 years since I ran my first run. Right, but 2016 was the last time I ran it. Was the last time I ran it, yeah. What do, you, what do you see about Coop that you think will help you get the best out of yourself come that last weekend. Yeah, gym. this is going to sound like an advertorial all of a sudden. <laughs> Sal, you can get into that. I've known Jason for, I mean, all three of us have known each other for a while. Yeah. I I would say just a, a very simple evaluation of myself. I know that in the sport, my greatest joy has been to carve out the journey that's most authentic to me. I don't interact with not all the time. I don't always interact with the pressure from sponsor or maybe, you know, media expectation, whatever that is, maybe in a way that I feel like, oh, I always need to do all the races. You know, I need to do, I have to do hard rack. I have to do Western States. I have to do the golden ticket set. Like from the time I started in the sport, like I genuinely really love the sport. I love the mountains. I love running on the trails. And, and Billy, this goes, all, you and I entered the scene at the same time. We entered the sport at the same time. And like, we were just talking the other day about how some of my favorite memories ever is just those first few years when it was Colin and Dave and Ethan and Josh and like all the adventures we had. We had so many amazing like mountain ventures. Mm-hmm. And at the core of the sport, I, I love it for the community. I love it for the beautiful places it's taken us. I love it for the way it is exposed both weaknesses and what we're capable of doing. I mean, doing things that like, I know as kids, us growing up, like never thought we'd run 50 miles at one time, just 100 a miles. Mile. Yeah, just a, just, just a 50 <laughs> miles. 50 miles. So, yeah, 50 mile next a lot has changed, a lot has changed. <laughs> but I think that I, from the time I was young, I, I do love competing. I like to get the best out of myself. I like to know that I'm able to keep improving and bettering myself, I think that's one of the greatest gifts we have as humans is that you can do something to get better. You can grow and you can change. So in the last, you know, I'd say 2019 was the last time I had a coach. I had Mario Fraley as my coach. And then 2020, the world fell apart and so no racing happened in 2020. 2021, I decided I really wanted to go after the goal of winning bad water. So that was self-coach. 2022, I was like, I'm going to do the Choose Strong Project and absolutely decimate myself, run all these big races. So didn't need a coach for that because uncoachable. <laughs> and then 2023 mm-hmm. kind of followed in the same suit where in that vein of great curiosity and the love for the sport, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to try 200s. For a time, I said I'd never do them, but I'm like, I'm going to go from it. And why not do all of them? So just do all. Let's, just, let's just do all of them in the span of Logical. five months. Let's just do <laughs> There's things I always do know about myself as an athlete. And it's also something, you know, all coaches from even the time I was a soccer player would tell me. And that's, I, I, my volume is always really high, but I think, one of the reasons is too, is because I've learned that I'm also incredibly durable. I don't break easily. And so if I want to go do something, I'm going to go do it. And if it seems really hard and difficult and out of reach and crazy, well, I'm going to go find that out for myself. I'm not going to let someone tell me. And I think that at the end of 2023, I had already had all these plans with what I was going to do this year. And then inside tracker was like, Hey, we have this spot to Western States. We would love to give it to you. And I thought, I don't know, because in 2016, before I even ran the race, I told myself, this is my last year doing it. And the reason why I made that choice is because Ann Trayson, who was my coach at the time, 
had said to me, Sal, if there's anything I could change about my career, it was, it would be that I wouldn't be so obsessed about Western States Mm -hmm. and that I would have done more races that I would have had my focus in other places. Now this is coming from someone who won that race 10 times in a row. I mean, this is a, I don't think anyone has ever won Western States as many times as Ann Trayson and legendary. And we had a very, very close relationship. And at that time, I was also being invited all over the world to race. And I have a great love and passion for traveling and other cultures and just seeing the world. And so before I got to that start line, I said, you know what? It's my third year doing Western States. I know people are fanatics about this race. I mean, it is their entire life and it isn't for me. And I love the race. I've been there in some capacity every single year, whether it's pacing someone, racing or um, jumping on the live stream media, and the yeah. media. I mean, I love the race, but I really took her words to heart. And I thought, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to become a fanatic about Western States. I love Western States. I always will. It's a very meaningful race. But I thought I'm going to take my coach's advice and grab a hold of every opportunity to do everything that's that's offered to me or if I want to go somewhere, I want to try something new. And so that's really because of her, like why I've continued on in the sport the way that I have. And so coming back to Western States, what I always knew every year that I did it, 14, 15 and 16, was that if you're going to race it well, you better be all in on the training. You got to do it right. It isn't something that you can just fill your schedule with tons of other races in the lead up to it. Um, It is a fast paced, very competitive race. And it doesn't matter how many years that I've coached myself or what I do know about coaching and programming. I really believe that there is great value in having someone look at you from the outside and say, hey, you got a few holes here. (laughs) There's where we can improve. Let me help you because, um, you know, that's something that I, I have always been aware of. I'm always aware of my weaknesses and where I lack, and I have a lot of them. And I think that in the last couple of years, I've also really missed just having a coach and someone who supports me, who I can talk to about it. And a sounding board, a sounding board. Yeah. And, and on a high level, I mean, someone that can, there, there's coaches, but then like for me, what's always been important is like, I need someone that like understands this level of coaching. It understands like sometimes the pressure and anxiety and um, the demands. And, and also I need someone that actually understands me. And so Jason for many years was always someone that I was like, dude, I bet he would be an amazing coach. I know you even said this before, if I could get one coach, it would be Jason Coop. I have been aware, um, most specifically in the last few years, how Jason is so present for his athletes. I'm like, dude, he is everywhere. And I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty observant person. Um, and I've always observed from afar, Jason, without you knowing, but how you've interacted with your athletes over the years, the way that you are there for them. And I've always admired that about you. And it's not anything I've ever told you, but um, that is something I've always admired is you go the extra mile. You genuinely understand and you are like this calm in the storm. And I think that's a what a lot of competitive athletes feel. It's a storm that they can't let anyone else know about around them. But that is what it feels like. You can look like the most calm, relaxed person. And it is there's so much going on in the inside. And not only that, only your coach and those who live in your home genuinely understand the dedication, hard work and sacrifice that you take in order to get to a start line, that it mean, it genuinely means everything. You gave up so much stuff, like you're tired most days of the week. And that's just something that, you know, people don't always appreciate and see and, and can even understand. So yeah, contacting Jason was on my mind for a long time, but I also was like, I knew a lot of people on his roster and I was like, well, <laughs> I'm definitely not uh, ranked <laughs> number two in the world. So, I mean, he's 
the people he has on his roster aren't just great runners. They are literally the superstars in the sport. And um, So, Coop, cool. what was your reaction when Sally reached out to you? And what, <laughs> where did you feel like Where's it had been a shock, shock and awe? Where's that text thread? Text thread is <laughs> <Text thread. laughs> actually pretty funny. Like, and it was like, we're done texting. Let me call you. Pull it up. I have to be kind of telling him. Yeah, I, I, I probably I, I, should. I distinctly heard Coop say that you're only 96, 97% the athlete that you should be. That's why I took away. <laughs> <laughs> There's still <laughs> three or four percent <laughs> fitness that he can, uh, that he can help out with. Maybe. Uh, I mean, listen, whenever whenever anybody reaches out to me and asks me to help them, it's, it's always an honor. And it, that's, I, I say that very, oh gosh. That sounds very just like a <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I say I, I say that whether it's somebody like Sally, who's had a very prolific and you know interesting you know running <laughs> career, doing all the things that, that that you've done, or somebody who nobody has ever heard of, right? I mean, I, I have a good chunk of my roster with just amazing average people that you know are trying to finish their first ultra marathon or trying yeah. to get a big belt buckle that you never kind of like know. I always think it's an honor because um, it, they're putting you in command of what is their most treasured resource, which is time and effort. And I take that really seriously. If Sally's going to come to me and say, hey, listen, tell me how to direct my time and effort. That's a big responsibility because you can't get that back. Right? You can't get your time back. You're going to put a lot of effort in training and, and stuff like that. So that's all, that's always where it starts from is I just realize that it's that, 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 that it's just kind of something serious. Um, I, I'm in a little bit of a privileged position where if I want to work with somebody, I'll work with them. If I don't want to work with them, then I, then I don't. And I can't work with everybody. Um, but it was very clear to me that this would be, for, first off, just fun for me. I mean, because it's all about me. I like, I like, work, I like working also with Also comedy. Uh, yeah, also yeah. comedy. It's, it, it's, cool. it's cool people. But um, like I said, it intrigued me just... Uh, from the standpoint of Sally's done a lot of things in her career, obviously, right? I mean, you've been very successful. You've done really hard things. You've been at both sides of the, you know, bell curve in terms of being competitive and also being really bad at sometimes. And you've <laughs> gone through the whole arc, right? You've kind of gone almost through the whole arc of life as well. And um, that storyline is really intriguing to me. And then you add to the, the, you know, add, you add to the fact that just as a person, even if you were, if, if we could like teleport to another dimension and we all weren't runners, we probably all still get along. Right? We have a different <laughs> line of hobbies and professions and things like that. So it was the right mixture of everything for me, right? It checked all the things that I want to do, you know, personally and uh, uh, personally and professionally. <laughs> so it's actually quite kind of an easy choice. I, I don't always have that. I don't always have like easy picks of you know, oh, this person approaches me like, do I want to work with them? Do I not want to work with them with you? That's probably why you're laughing at that text message because <laughs> that's a reflection of the decision actually making being easy. And I don't have to think about it. Instead of thinking about it, I could joke about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it, it, so there wasn't a lot of, I guess to answer your question, yeah. there wasn't a lot of thought behind it because it was a relatively easy decision because of all those factors I just mentioned. And that, not to say that what is necessarily better, but it must be easier when you have a motivated athlete who's who, like, that's not her shortcoming is <laughs> getting motivated to do. If anything, you probably have to like rein her in and like pull her back a bit. Mustang Sally. Like, I, did <laughs> Mustang <laughs> Sally. I don't know. I mean, I, listen, I, I keep a variety of athletes on my roster because it makes me better for each individual person. So I have people that are highly motivated or over motivated. I have people that are under motivated and everything in between. I have people that are great physical athletes, right? You put them on a treadmill, they're going to test amazing. I have people who are not great physical athletes. You put them on a treadmill and they're going to test really poorly. And I like having that mix of, of, of athletes to work with because I do believe that I can, I can professionally develop in the, in each of those areas and kind of keep my game sharp. But also, I feel that I can help them across all of those different, uh, all, all of those different elements. So I don't know whether I'd answer that question like, "Oh, it must be easy to have this and not that with an athlete." I think everybody has every every person that that that, that I work with has this unique set of 
personality and life circumstances and goals and everything else that uh, I try not to be, I try not to keep that homogenous um, uh, because I just enjoy it so much. And I think I'm in a better position for each individual having that kind of breadth of, of, of experience. But certainly you do different things and you communicate differently for athletes that are whatever category that you want to say, highly motivated or under motivated or highly talented or whatever, the tactics that you take are actually kind of like markedly different between all of those. There's no cookie cutter like, ah, oh, well, everybody's going to get the blue program or whatever it is. Um, uh, so what you actually do is highly tailored to who, who she is and her life situation and what her goals were with the race, just like anything else. Yeah. <laughs> You're smiling. I want to know what's the text yeah. message said. Well, that, that, that it was, was. This will be good. Oh yeah, it was really good. It was. Uh, good morning, Jason. I have a question for you. And the emoji is. It's the emoji, emoji like <laughs> it's the emoji of a deer in a headlight. It's like it's this one. Oh, <laughs> the, oh, big yeah. the big yeah. bug eyes, and I go, "Will you coach me for Western States? It would be so fun." His response: "Oh Jesus!" <laughs> <laughs> and then I knew I was like, "Yes!" I can like picture Jason's face. I can totally picture your face, and I was like laughing. Um, and I said, "You know, ha! ha I, d I mean, I definitely want to be your star athlete, but I would so appreciate your guidance." I haven't had a coach since 2018, not 19. Yeah. Um, and his response was really sweet. He says, I mean, you are a star regardless of where you are in the field. And I go, that's very gracious. And he's like, all right, let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, so and then that's what happened. And then right yeah. away, you're like, let's talk tomorrow morning. And, um, and then that was it. It was, and then I knew it was a perfect fit because he says, perfect. I just spoke to you for 930 MT. I go, great. I appreciate your time. I go, is that one hour ahead of California? He's like, yes. Hashtag math. And I was like, this is, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so, you know, and then we had the conversation and it was like, all right, send me over a log of your previous training. And um, so I sent him over like six weeks, what I've been doing the last six weeks. Here's like what my buildup has, has looked like. And a um, little bit of discussion about what I've been doing. I mean, I think Jason's kind of been aware of my training. I mean, a lot of it is in the media. I see the Instagram version of it. Yeah, so realize. the Instagram, <laughs> the controversial, sometimes, you know, things that float around in, in social media about how much I lift or, you know, crazy stuff that I'm doing. But um, that was that was really meaningful to me because I thought, well, you know, Jason knows me. I mean, he's also just my friend. So, um, and I knew that's what I needed. I didn't need like a coach who was just known for being a good coach and knew nothing about me. See the, the relationship, relationship side is the most important thing to me. And I think what I know to be true about a coach is like, you can't just coach them in running. You have to know them as a person. If you're going to be an effective coach, you have to know them as a person. Yep. And I didn't have the time or energy um, to even want to go and take that time to develop that with someone. I was like, one, I don't have enough time to do that. Um, but also, I'm very picky about the people that I work with in every avenue of where I work, whether it's, you know, creatively, um, whether it's people that help us with our podcast or our, our YouTube with my book. Um, you know, if I work with people, it's, I absolutely trust those people. And I think that was the single most important thing to me was I trust Jason. I trust the way he coaches. I know that he knows me and, and I was very straightforward too. I was like, dude, nothing is, nothing's off topic. You want to talk about anything we're going to talk about, whether it's my training, like my, how I eat nutrition and all this stuff. I mean, I was like really blunt even yeah. about nutrition stuff. I'm like, for the record, so you know, <laughs> I've never had an eating disorder. Like I really believe in race weight. So if you want to, if we're going to talk about weight, just, you know, this is how much I weigh. And I'm all about like, what do I need to do to get better? What is the food that I need to eat? Like what, you know, like I'm very, actually very black and white with my training. I don't get you know, offended or, you know, I'm not, not going to go cry if something doesn't work out or if there's a suggestion or I look at everything is just a part of how can I get better? And, um, 
you know, that's kind of, that's, that's where we started just rolling all that out. So we're looking at, we're talking what, like eight years since your last Western States. Um, what is it now? <laughs> Six years since your last coach. And mm-hmm. you are now looking at Western States. I mean, we alluded to you coming here every year or coming to Western mm-hmm. States every year and participating in how much you love that race. But yeah, there might be listeners out there. You know, they hear Western States, West States, but never actually got boots on the ground, experienced it, or maybe even tuned in. To you, why is that race so important? Why is it so special? This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. One of the relationships that I am most proud of in my life is the relationship I have with Eddie James McRae. And I'll tell you what, a common misconception about strong relationships is that they have to be easy to be right. You know, sometimes the best relationships happen when both people choose to put in the work to make them great. And I believe therapy can be a great place to work through the challenges you face in all of your relationships, whether with friends, work, your significant other, or anyone. In past experience, I have found that therapy is helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries. It empowers you to be the best version of yourself. It isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma or have major challenges in life. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Become your own soulmate, whether you're looking for one or not. Visit betterhelp.com slash choose strong today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash choose strong you know the race with you know the first year that i um was signed with nike i mean that was like a really big deal to me because i one never believed that that would happen i knew even when i got signed that you know it's like come on like i'm not like the best female trail runner in the world this is a massive company um i was a little apprehensive even to sign with them and i didn't have a lot of confidence in myself and just three, four weeks after signing, I was already registered for a golden ticket race. It was in my mind to go to Western States. I think everyone in our training group, we always said, whoever gets into Western States, we're all currying and pacing. And so we didn't know which one of us was gonna get in. Well, in all of that dream talk for whatever that, the whole year that we had talked about that previously, I get signed and I'm registered to run this golden ticket race, but now suddenly I'm wearing a kit. And I felt, I mean, you documented this, but I felt the weight of the entire world on me because at this time too, I was kind of ripped to shreds for being signed. I mean, people are like, who is this person? And you know, what do they run? And um, I think even on letsrun.com, I I was ripped to shreds on letsrun.com because people pulled up stuff from like a 10, I've never raced road races. And they were bringing up a 10K that I probably ran as a charity bib with some friends. They're like, oh, slow she is running her 10K. And then the one trail race I had had, I think the year before that, I had run, I had had a fractured uh, leg. And I, so I hopped in this trail race to test it out. It was a really short trail race. So they took these two races and ripped me to shreds and was like, she's crap. And then- It's kind of a badge of honor to be on. (laughs) Oh, it was was terrible. I was the only girl on the team. I was the only girl on the team. And then we did this photo shoot. And I remember when Nike posted this picture of me running with with the guys who were up in Oregon for this photo shoot, my first like professional photo shoot. It's like so exciting. It's like crazy. All the things you think about of being a professional athlete is like coming it. true. Yeah, I've made it. Like I never thought this would be me. And like, it's like I'm a mom of like two little kids. Like this is just not the story that for the typical professional athlete. And I remember when Nike posted the picture of me and all the comments that came in, she's huge, she's big, she's fat. Like there's no way that she's an endurance athlete. Like it again, ripped me to shred. So I go to the start line with all of that. I mean, I had only been signed for like not even a month and I already felt like I don't belong here. I don't fit into this space. And this race is going just to like 
put that nail into the coffin for me. I remember you carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, <laughs> just in your, and how you were breathing at the start line. Yeah, I think like, I cried actually walking up to the start line because I couldn't handle that pressure. I mean, for me, the sport of ultra running was so fun. It was adventurous, it was fun, it was time with friends, like some of my best memories and conversations were on the trails. And now I wasn't good enough to be there. Now I didn't belong and I didn't look the part, I didn't deserve to be there. So winning that ticket to Western States will forever symbolize this breakthrough and this belief that I finally was able to grasp, like you do belong and it's okay to be here and it's okay to not look the part. It's okay that your path to this spot looked different than so many other women and proceed. <laughs> And so we show up to Western States and I knew getting in the top 10 would just be a dream come true. And I got 10th place. Yep. And so it was three years of Western States, you know, two times in the top 10. And that race changed my life. I mean, the community of Western States is beautiful. It's an experience and a joy in and of itself, whether you experience as a volunteer, as a pacer, um, a crew member, whatever it is that you're doing, it, it's an incredible weekend. And for many athletes, it changes their life forever. It changes, yeah. if you're not signed and you get the top 10, you're signed. By, by the end of the week, you're, you're gonna be signed. And so um, I will always love it, I'll always cherish it. But some of my greatest memories are with friends there that I will never, ever forget. And of course, Billy, we did the Western Time film on my first year there, which is, will always be my favorite documentary. It was, I mean, that that year set both of our careers into like a really cool trajectory. And we still reminisce about it all yeah. the time. It's so beautiful. So the the race is very meaningful to me. It's very precious to me. And it's not a race that I take lightly. And so when the year started, I thought I could try and coach myself. But man, if I want to be better, I have to have a coach. And Jason was immediately the first person. Starting to feel a lot of pressure. <laughs> so I took all the pressure off and put on Jason. <laughs> that Western States magnified glass, man, hits, hits mean, differently. <laughs> we're, you know, once again, I mean, being involved in elite, elite sports, you kind of realize how big that magnifying glass can actually be either on the stage itself. So whether it's a, just a big race or when an athlete takes a market leap in their progression. So they go from getting third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or kind of whatever it is to winning something, mm -hmm. like winning something really big. And some athletes handle that trajectory really well, and some athletes don't. And um, I do think that there's a big, like kind of like learning lesson in, in all of that, that it, it is much different. It's much different when you're the returning champion. It's much different mm -hmm. when you have won a race and then you're kind of going back. Um, and the counsel that that athlete can like put around them, not just in coaching, I'm obviously biased to that, but within their, their sponsors and their advocates and the team that they have and their support, you know, network, whether it's a spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, kind of whatever it is actually can play a, a, a really impactful part in how that whole process gets managed because there's no blueprint for that. Right. There's no blueprint for what you just experienced, right? Going from an unknown person to doing a photo shoot with a lot of other professional athletes. There's nobody that'll hand you a book and say, Hey, Sally, if you just follow these 10 steps, you're going to be able to manage the criticism that you come across on the let's run.com forums <laughs> or be able to handle the spotlight or the weight on your shoulders, right? As, as Billy was uh, mentioning. There's no exact blueprint for, for, for any of that. And the, the, the antidote to that uh, lack of blueprint is putting the right people around you that believe in you and can have your back and contextualize the situation when you are unable to contextualize it because of this fog that's put on you by the spotlight or the weight or whatever analogy you kind of want to use. I, I've seen that a lot. Like I've seen that, that not, not every story is exactly the same. But that general storyline of getting thrust in the spotlight, kind of not knowing what to do with it. Maybe you don't handle it perfectly or whatever. And I, I, I once again, I empathize with the athletes that are going through that. Those are good, those are good problems to have. Mm -hmm. They're still problems nonetheless, but they're good problems to have. Mm -hmm. 
the solution to it is having the right people around you yes. that can help that they can that, that just can look at look at it from the outside look at it from the outside and give you the right context on what is actually going on you're good so he took my training and had a little peek at it and and it's and my training has totally changed and it's great i love it but it would absolutely love it i mean it would have changed by, as a byproduct of you doing <laughs> what you did last year to do you doing what you're going to do this year like yeah it's not like, 200s yeah it's completely different, different training you're, you're running a different sport right mm -hmm. now right so it's not but like i said there's 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 always some change that comes inherently with taking on a new coach or moving from coach to coach or taking on different counsel or even taking ownership over your own training. But the majority of the catalyst is <laughs> just doing something different. It's not any magic that I'm pulling out of, yeah. you know, the training hat or anything like that. It's just like, okay, you're doing this and this is what you got to do to get ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a good ride so far. We, we are, yeah, like five weeks in. So, this is my uh... fun's just beginning. It is just, well, it's just beginning, but you got a deadline, right? You got a hard yeah. deadline in front of you. I I don't like. I'm not the biggest fan of the short term projects because I realize that endurance sports inevitably there it's all chronic in nature, right? You take months and years to get good at these things, not weeks or a couple of months. Um, so, you know, when, whenever that, whenever that's the case, you kind of, you really have, it really makes you focus in on the things that are going to be the most impactful because you have such a short, like such a short period of time. And one of the things that you can do to find the things that are most impactful, and this is to, to your story earlier, Sally, is you just pour over the training and you look at what's worked and what hasn't worked and you use that as a little bit of your blueprint to go forward because you don't have the opportunity to make the mistakes and figure them out again because the time frame is too short and you just happen to have a, a really robust career that even without everything being in training peaks right you've got all in your like paper logs or whatever <laughs> even without some sort of sophisticated like counting system you can just look through it almost through like a Publix, uh like what the public would have access to and say, okay, Sally's done really well over here. She's done really poorly over here. What was she doing when she was doing really well when she was 10th <laughs> at Western States, right? Let's look at some of the, let's look at some of that blueprint and see if we can come up with some themes to 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 to, to kind of like catalyze the improvement initially. Well, you also finished seventh. Yeah. As, as your highest yeah. rating. So oh short changer. <laughs> true, true, spot, true, true valuable. <laughs> yeah so we are uh 14 weeks out and still got a lot team of work sally to do. <laughs> still got a lot of work to do well, here. but um and you have a lot of, of athletes at western states this year so you know the the coop camp is uh it's gonna be a solid one and i'm excited about it it's been fun interacting with the athletes that are on the roster you know, seeing who's on there and yeah, it's feeling like I'm a part of a, a pretty cool team. It's kind of weird. Cause like, it's not set up to be a team sport. I definitely don't like, yeah. like, like have a, like, like have an overall team orchestration for anything that I do. It's very much yeah. individualized, but I've kind of like learned through the in-service that, uh, that I had you saw to do for you guys as well as a few interactions that if a few, not everybody, yeah. but a few, a, a few athletes, I can kind of view it as almost like a pseudo team or something yeah. like that. Oh yeah. It's been, it's just been interesting. I've, I've definitely not propagated that intentionally. I kind of stay in the background and let it, yeah. and let it simmer naturally. Yeah. But it's been, it's been fun just to see how y'all react to it. Yeah. Cause trust me, I'm very cognizant of the fact that I have athletes that desire the same thing that are in the same race. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I cannot play favorites. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, very, very cautious and deliberate and cognizant of that, uh, of that aspect. And so I very, I deliberately, I don't play favorites. If I've got, everybody gets equal time and attention and, 
I'm going to do something or not do something for them, like during a race and stuff like that. Like that is a something that just because of, for whatever reason, this year's Western States has just kind of serendipitously worked out where I, I do have a lot of athletes in the race. I'm trying to, I'm trying to just be very cautious for how like race day is actually managed because of that potential source of not conflict that I would intentionally create, but it's usually conflict that's created via misperception or whatever it is. Sorry um, to put you on the spot here, and I know we're probably winding down soon, but I'm curious. We had a lot of conversations about what it's like from the coaching out the relationship on the elite side. I'm curious if there's one story that stands out, maybe from the non-elite side of things, where you worked intimately with an athlete over a course of months or years and saw either like a very unique trans uh, transformation or, I don't know, anecdote story that maybe some of the listeners out there can better relate to than... Oh, you only placed tenth, and was it saying that you're not giving enough credit? Because you suck. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, well, well. somebody who who dreamt really big and uh, used you, and um, you know, throughout the course of that teamwork, yielded this beautiful result. Um, you know, I'm, I, I'll I'll use an athlete that I don't work with uh, any longer, just to kind of keep my current roster uh, <laughs> private. Keep in, yeah, kind of keep it kind of keep it private, and this guy wouldn't. Uh, uh, wouldn't mind me uh, mentioning this as well because he's also um, he's also a great friend. Um, but it's, it's this guy Andre Bloomberg who lives in Hong Kong, and um, he had the desire to run the you know Hard Rock 100, and as you know, it's a long shot for kind of everybody. Mm-hmm. And um, he he finally serendipitously kind of got into the race. Very normal, humble circumstances. Did everything he could to try to try to train for hard rock on the concrete steps around yeah. Hong Kong. Mm. And if you guys know the trail oh, running around there, goodness, it's, yeah. it's good, but stairs. it's not, yeah, it's a lot, of, it's a lot of like <laughs> concrete stairs and things like that. Normal job, very high level professional and, uh, uh, in kind of like a hospital setting where he's involved in the tech there, long hours, very, you know, bureaucratic sitting behind a computer type of deal, not something that's conducive to, you know, an outdoor, uh, kind of an outdoor lifestyle. And, um, he, he had this incredible story where he was your very prototypical party boy in his thirties going out to clubs and drinking way too much and staying out late at night and things like that. And running kind of like literally turned around his life. And so to see the latter part of that apex as well, where not only running kind of turned around his life, but now he's also doing one of the hardest races on the planet as a very kind of like average, you know, average finisher was actually uh, really special. And um, probably the most special piece of it is this was in a uh, clockwise year. So they go over Handy's Peak, which is the highest point of the course uh, at mile 70. And um, the way that the course works out for the, the, the listeners and the viewers who are not very familiar with it, there's this one, what I think is kind of a critical aid station that is impossible to get to because you have to drive around like five hours to actually get there, but it, it's with like 50K to go. And um, so I, I took the liberty of renting one of the quad vehicles, one of the big four by four vehicles in Silverton, Colorado, and we drove up and over Cinnamon Pass, which is a notoriously difficult four by four road to actually drive. Are you talking about Sherman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sherman yeah, station. Just Sherman yeah. station. Oh man, I, I so I that yeah, far. yeah. So I took I took his um his yeah his wife who doesn't drive. His wife doesn't. Oh. His wife doesn't drive. She's she's very very lovely. Paper for listening. <laughs> I love you very much. So I took her in this rickety four x four van that we uh, or four x four vehicle that we rented in Silverton, just to go back to the Sherman Aid Station and give him a gel or something, you know, completely like benign like that. So the, all this stuff that I mentioned before about flying across the Atlantic and going to an elite athlete or staying up in the middle of the night or doing this for whatever, those, those always get the storylines because they were with the people that have the cameras around them and stuff like that. But it's the exact same for, thing for this normal guy who finished in. 40 hours or 42, I can't remember what it was, 40 hours, very middle to back of the pack type of person where I'm taking his poor wife who's completely <laughs> terrified of driving this like ridiculously 
you know, treacherous mountain road, <laughs> two in the morning, she's like entrusting oh me gosh. with, you know, like literally her life and to get all this stuff, you know, back, back to Andre. <laughs> um, it's the same, it's the same kind of storyline, right? Wow. You go out and do that and you make that personal connection with, with, with somebody mm -hmm. who's really meaningful to them. And, you know, we, we have this proposition in sports where, um, we're trying to improve their athletic capacity through training, right? And who knows what that proposition is? I mentioned it might be 2% or 3% or 10%. Sometimes I think just being there is just as impactful as all the programming, if not more. So just driving back there, like I look at through, I look at it through an ergogenic lens, like how can I be ergogenic for the athlete? How can I improve their performance? Yeah, I can give sophisticated programming and tell you how the programming works and things like that. But sometimes it's just you rent a four by four vehicle and you drive it two in the morning to this thing. And that provides a whatever percent improvement that you can't get out of the training process. So, like I said, it's just the same thing. Nobody would ever, if I didn't tell that story right now, probably nobody would ever know except for mm -hmm. me and his wife because we're the only two people in the car. Maybe the aid station workers kind of figured it out. But it's the exact same thing. If you just be there, it ends up having an impact on people sometimes far great, far greater than what you'd have done for the last several months during the training process. I feel like that's a, yeah, boy, Scott Jurek, Valentine's Day meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I love you so much. I drive to Sherman for you yeah. to drop off. You know that drive is like. That's yes, I do. Yeah. Thankfully, I didn't have to do it. Bob Loomis did it when we oh, went God. to see Jimmy. <laughs> and I somehow fell asleep in the back. Yeah. I mean, that was like chitty chitty bang bang. Probably, probably <laughs> I was so off. tired. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang. I was so tired. I somehow fell asleep. And then Rafi fell asleep. I yeah. drive it's not for the faint of heart. Well, I I feel like this is also a good story to end the podcast on because it's really the reason why I brought you into in here today, Jason. I just I really wanted to have a different conversation with you. We could have talked extensively about how to program an athlete and we could have talked about nutrition and pacing and racing strategies and um what's the top two tips for new ultra runners how and long runners. should your longest long run be yeah how long yeah <laughs> all the things oh my really goodness long. i th i think there's already a lot of that information is out there but you know my hope was just to expose a, another side of you that we always don't get to see all the time and really um, just show who you are. And it is really awesome to hear these stories, not only how you've impacted your athlete's life, but I think just that a core, at the core of who you are, how much you care about people, you care about the sport, but you genuinely care about getting on a level with every athlete you coach to understand them, to empathize with them, and to see them be the best that they can be. And I, I really appreciate that about you. And I appreciate you being here in Huntington Beach, traveling all the way from Colorado Springs, where you had two feet of snow. And, right. and now we're here on the sunny coast. I know we're going to go run for an hour right now, which I'm really looking forward to. But um, I just want to say thank you publicly for allowing me to be on your roster. The journey's been incredible so far. And I know it's going to be um, a good one moving forward, even past Western States. There you go, big so. picture. I appreciate the sentiment, Sally. Like I said, yeah. it's an honor. Yeah, it's been awesome. Where can people follow you? Where's the best place for people to buy your book? I've talked about your book several times on the podcast already. Uh, we get a lot of F8. We do question and answer quite a bit on this podcast, but um, your book is always a great reference. And It's the Bible. Uh, it it's is. A Bible. You don't know where don't to start. Know you don't know That's where to start. Too. Pick up Jason's book because it is a wealth of really good knowledge. But you, I mean, there's so much in there that's just helpful. It's, it's great to have on your bookshelf just as a reference. But um, yeah, tell us where to follow you. Where can we get your book? Uh, my social handles are just my first name, last name. So my last name is spelled K K O O P. The uh, book is anywhere you can find books, most no notably Amazon. Uh, if you order it through my website, it'll probably take me two weeks to ship it because we just <laughs> went through. I'm not home a lot. I, I'm more than happy to do that and include a personal note or whatever. Ha ha happy to do that. But I pick, pack, and ship those books all, all myself with, with, my, uh, with my army of one, uh, with my office army of one. Uh, you can also go to the audiobook side of things. You consume your content that way. The audiobook is actually kind of cool where I do like podcast style interviews in the middle of it. 
Oh, oh yeah, I remember when you were developing this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I okay. totally stole that from David Goggins. Sorry, sorry, bro. <laughs> Shout out to Golden yeah. 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 Don't, don't, don't come after me for that intellectual property. I'll completely admit that I stole that idea. Um, She's copying every move I do. Brick butt. I don't want to be. David's the last person I've worked with. Don't trust me. I'm smarter than that. Um, and then you can check out my podcast, which is just the, the Coop cast, which is definitely more of a science oriented uh, training uh, podcast where I bring on a lot of PhD style eggheads to talk about their research and how it actually uh, how it actually can Im- impact training and performing in the uh, ultra marathon. So, and the array. And we'll make sure we put all of those links in the description of this podcast. So make sure you check there. Um, and we'll also link to Billy Yang's links as well. Billy, I'm good, are man. you are you yeah. working on anything right yeah, now? I want to know yeah. what projects you have. Yeah coming down the pipeline because you whenever <laughs> we get together you immediately want to talk about politics which yeah. you don't want to talk about i found out no, no I, the project I, you're doing the, the <laughs> thing that asked me the most psyched right now in the in in the vein of you know talking about always being a student and, and always learning is um skiing i am so psyched on oh, skiing the so cowboy has nice. just like been eating up uh time on the slopes and getting you know leveling up from green to blue and to blue to like blue black and like dabbling and flirting with some black. So I'm, um, I'm enjoying that, but no, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to another great season of, uh, you know, running, um, adventuring in the mountains with, um, between you know, races. I have some, uh, some like, uh, it destination, like multi-day tracks that I'm hosting as well in the Dolomites and in, TMB again. So man, I'm just still living the dream. It's been awesome. As Sally said, like 2014 on, it's been somehow being able to find a niche and in, in doing something that you love. It's not always great when you all, you know, kind of merge the two, but most of the time it's pretty rad. So I'm stoked about all of, all of that. Well, thank you, both of you, for being here today. Thank you so much to our listeners. If you are still out running, so maybe you're getting that long run in. Thank you for enduring with us. This has been a nice long podcast. I'm not still in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but as you know, we always appreciate you. Thank you for being a part of the community. And we encourage you to keep choosing strong in all that you do. Mm-hmm.